things for you to bring it to... Is there anything that is impossible for God? No, I'm considering he's the one who has given me his word. He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass. God's heart is he wants you blessed, so, you know, you put him first with your tithes, he's going to open up opportunities, he's going to open up favors, he's going to open up more clientele, he's going to open up all kinds of blessings from heaven, right? But um, what the Lord brought me to here, actually, I was in my study when I was asking the Lord that. I said, Lord, so what's the deal? And he said this to me, and, and, bef and let me just preface what I'm going to say, because some of you will probably already know this, but there will probably be some of you that don't know this, and it may shock you. So I'm going to set you up a little bit and make it a little easier for you to not be so shocked. <laughs> um, I'm getting ready to tell you something. When the Lord told me, I'd never heard it preached. And when the Lord told me it, I challenged him. Because one thing, I've had a number of supernatural things, visions and dreams and audible voice. I've had some supernatural things. One of the offices I stand in is seer. I see things when I'm preaching a lot of times. God shows me things about different people. And so that was one re reason God had me so close to Brother Hagen. And um, so Brother Hagen told me this, and my pastor, who was my first mentor, I've had two mentors in my life, and that was the late Curtis Bradford and then the late Kenneth E. Hagen. Uh, Curtis Bradford, let me just take a side journey just for a minute. Because I know some of you bought my book, Long Life, last time I was here. How many got that book last time I was here? A couple of you in this service, but we sold out of them, so I did bring more. But God told me years ago about long life. He told me, he said, Larry, I never promised my children long existence. He said, that's the world system. You could live to, to be a sanitarian and exist and not be strong physically, not be strong mentally. He said, my, my system is just the opposite of the world system. The world system of aging is you get to a certain point, you go, you go over the hill, and then it's downhill from there. He said, you can't find over the hill in the Word of God. He said, I expect you as you get into your old age years, like Moses, he told me this, he said, and I looked and sure enough, from 80 to 120, Moses did more for God than he did his first 80 years. And I said, but when God showed me that, I said, then Moses isn't going to outdo me. <laughs> and here's why. I'm, first of all, under a better covenant. But even more than that, Moses did not have God living on the inside. I do. So, baby, I was just in the gym working out the other day, and another minister walked up to me, and he saw me working out. And he's just started. He's kind of overweight, just gotten into working out, trying to lose some weight and get in shape. He saw me in there working out. He said, Brother Larry, because he heard I just turned 60 just on the 30th of July. I had a birthday. I just turned 60. And he said, Larry, he said, man, look at you. 60 must be the new 20. I said, I'll take that. I've been saying 60 is the new 30 for me, but I'll take the 20 because <laughs> I'm in better shape now than when I was 40. I'm getting, I'm getting stronger and better. And so when I'm 80 and 90, if Jesus tarries, 90, 100, I'm not going to lose my mental faculties. In fact, I'm going to be wiser the older I get, sharper mentally the older I get, but I'm going to stay strong physically. If Moses at 120 could have all of his natural forces, that means all of his bones worked, all of his ligaments, all of his joints, all of his muscles, uh, everything worked in his body. He did not have osteoporosis, arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis. He only had Goditis. <laughs> if he could do that under the old covenant, how much more are you and me under a better covenant? Come on. We have got to quit thinking the world system. But anyway, I said all that to say this. I just want to give this little side journey testimony for a minute. My pastor, the late Curtis E. Bradford, he decided he wanted to go be with Jesus. He had been in the ministry for 50-some years, and 
He just, his wife left a couple years ago and went to heaven, and he was just deciding, you know what? I want to go. I want to go to heaven. But he didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell me because I'd have tried to talk him out of it. Because he, he was the picture of health. I mean, strong and healthy. He worked out all the time. He ate healthy. He, just, he, had, he took no medicine and had no pains. Nothing wrong with him. So I would have tried to talk him to stay around a little longer just because he had such wisdom. But anyway, the only people he told, he called his two daughters. He had two daughters. And they didn't go to his church where he's pastored all these years. So he called them and, and brought them to his house one day and kind of just in a nonchalant way said, honey, just wanted to let you know I am doing great. Nothing wrong with me. You girls know I work out all the time and nothing wrong with me. But I just want you to know that if you hear something anytime soon about me, everything's fine. (laughs) What what are you talking about, Dad? I just wanted you girls to know just (laughs) nothing wrong. I just, you know, just wanted you to know if you hear anything about me, that everything is fine. Oh, okay, Dad. Okay, sure. Okay, everything's fine. They had no idea that he was talking about his departure. So uh, a couple months later, one of the girls gets a phone call because she was the closest to his house. And she went over to the house because nobody, he wasn't answering his phone, and so they asked her to go check on him. So he went, she went over to the house and went back to his bedroom, and he was just laying on the bed. She thought he was taking a nap. So she tried to wake him up, found out he was gone. Well, of course, the paramedics come, and they try and find the doctors. They could not find anything wrong. The only thing they could say is his heart stopped. <laughs> yeah. I guess if you leave your body, your heart's not going to keep beating. <laughs> and, uh, and it just, I mean, it made me mad at first because he didn't tell me. <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd, of course, probably try to talk him out of it. But then I got so thrilled and so glad, I thought, my first mentor showed me how you're supposed to leave. When you're ready to go, you don't need to be sick. You don't need to be in pain. You can just let your family know. Of course, I would have done a little bit different. I would have kind of like under the old covenant when Abraham, different ones, just yielded up the ghost and left. They called all the, everybody together and blessed them and partied first. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have a big going away party and then pff, yield up the ghost and go. But uh, it just blessed me so much to see that. Hmm. But he, that was a little side journey. I don't know who that was for, but somebody needed to hear that. You need to start changing your vision on aging. Your old age years ought to be your most prosperous, wisest. You ought to be wiser than ever. You ought to have more money than you had when you were young. And you still ought to be strong and healthy physically and even sharper mentally. Amen. Don't go the world system. Um, But anyway, my mentor told me this. And then Brother Hagin told me this too because they both knew I had a call of my li- call on my life where I would probably have supernatural things happen in my ministry. And they said this, they said, Larry, they said, I don't care if Jesus appears to you. I don't care if angels appear to you. I don't care if you hear audible voices. I don't care if you have dreams and visions. Don't ever follow after or believe something supernatural if it doesn't line up with the Bible. That's, right. Amen. That's what they told me. And I've had people come up to me and tell me about supernatural experience they've had. And I I believe they were real and supernatural, but they weren't God. Because when they told me what what the so-called thing happened, and and they said, do you think that was God? I said, no, that wasn't God. That's totally contrary to the Word of God. So you don't believe somebody just because they come up and say, I'm prophet so-and-so, or I'm prophetess so-and-so, and I have a word for you. Yeah, well, let me read a word for you. (laughs) Thus saith the Lord. Amen. 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 Anyway, when the Lord spoke what I'm getting ready to tell you, it it threw me off because it went against what I preach. (laughs) God was correcting correcting my doctrine. And I had preached it, and most of my friend pastors and well-known ministers on television, everything else preach it. We all preach it. So when the Lord said it to me, that I was preaching it wrong, I challenged him. And I said, Lord, this is what the scripture says right here. And then the Lord uh, challenged him, and then he took me through the scriptures and showed me that I'd been missing it, that I'd just been going along with everybody else. And, you know, none of us know it all. I don't care how versed in the Bible. That's one thing I learned about Brother Hagin, that I love being so close to him. I found out 
uh, even after over 60 years in the ministry, he said, man, the more you learn, the more you see you don't know. In other words, we only see in part and know in part. So no minister, I don't care how, how far you want to put them up on a pedestal because you know them on television or something, they, they don't know it all. They see in part. And there's parts you know that I don't know and that I know that they don't know and they don't know that I don't know. And so this, we need each other. We do. Amen. So anyway, the Lord said this to me. So you ready? Did I soften it enough to get you ready for it? Okay, so, so the Lord said this. He said, I no longer rebuke the devourer for my children under the new covenant. I said, but I preach you rebuke the devourer. He said, I no longer rebuke the devourer for my children under the new covenant. I said, Lord, I said, that's, that's, I said, and then I tried to impress God by mentioning, I said, now, brother so-and-so preaches you rebuke the devourer, and brother so-and-so, and sister so-and-so, and started naming all the well-known television preachers, first of all, that preach it, and then I named all my pastor friends, I started, I, he said, I no longer rebuke the devourer for my children under the new covenant, I've done better for you than that. Hmm, before I tell you what, what else he said. Uh, are you in Malachi? Yes. All right. Malachi chapter 3. Of course, verse 10, bring all the tithes in the storehouse. And then verse 11. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Isn't that what it says? Yes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So notice, notice he said, I'll rebuke the devourer. This was talking to the children of Israel. Of course, it was old, under the old covenant. We know that. But he said, bring the tithes, and then I'll open the windows of heaven blessings. Now, he said, what was the purpose? This is what the Lord started teaching me. He said, what was the purpose of me rebuking the devourer? I said, well, it says right here so that the, the devourer would not destroy the fruits of their ground, which you understand is their paychecks, right? The fruits of their ground, that's their businesses, and the fruits are the, pay, the money you get from the business, right? So the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, because if your vine cast the fruit before the time, you wouldn't have any fruit to take to market. So there, again, it's talking about their finance. Right. So he says, so he said, so the purpose of me rebuking the devourer is so they wouldn't have their finances stolen. I said, yes, sir. He said, then my windows of heaven blessings included the fruits of their ground going to market and being prosperous and, and their vines not casting the fruit before the time. In other words, my windows of heaven blessings included financial freedom in their lives. I said, yes, sir. He said, he said, then when I rebuke the devourer, he asked me this, then when I rebuke the devourer, do you believe he had to obey me? Well, who is the devourer? The devil. Now remember, this is before the devil was dethroned from, you know, whipped, stripped, and made a show of openly, right? So this is before Jesus has gone to the cross and then got the keys of the key kingdom and went up and, and purchased our eternal redemption for us. So this is old covenant here. And yet God says, I had to rebuke the devourer. And then he asked me, do you think to devour the devil had to obey me? And I immediately thought back to to Genesis when God's, remember after Adam sinned and God came in and found him and, and then remember God had a conversation with the devil? Now wait a minute, this is after Adam sinned, which means it's after Satan became the God of this world. So God comes onto the scene and talks to the God of this world. And what does he say to him? On your belly you go! And eat dust all the days of your life. Who does it sound like is in charge? God. That throws off some religious stinking thinking right there. Well, the God of this world, we couldn't do anything. And God, oh, no, no, no. God was still in charge. He had a plan already set from the foundations of the earth that the devil couldn't stop. But it just shows you who's in charge. In other words, the devil had to go on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life got a terrible diet <laughs> all right so when God rebuked the devourer did the devourer have to stop mm -hmm. obviously because God wouldn't just 
mince his word. He wouldn't just say something and, well, you know, the devil doesn't have to obey me, does he? He's the God of this world. No. If God rebuked the devourer, if you look up the Hebrew word for rebuke, it means to chide or reprove. In other words, God said, take your hands off their finances. What did the devil have to do? Which meant then the children of Israel were financially wealthy. Most of you know that from studying the scriptures anyway, but I'm just reminding you, I'm showing you why. Because the devil couldn't devour their finances. And then the Lord said to me, if I was rebuking the devourer in the new covenant, all of my children would be financially wealthy. I said, whoa. I said, um, all right. He said, the reason I had to rebuke the devourer under the old covenant is because my children under the old covenant did not have authority over him. First of all, they didn't even know anything about him like you and I do in the new covenant, but they didn't have authority over the devil because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. I said, okay, Lord, but you still got to take me to the New Testament because, and oh, no, this is what the Lord said, which, which then I asked him to take me to the New Testament. He said, Larry, and I mean, he read my mail and stepped on my toes, so I'm just going to step on yours. Is that okay? Make me feel better. <laughs> he, he stepped on my toes and he said, what you've been doing is taking one verse of Scripture and preaching doctrine with it. Because we made doctrine that God rebukes the devourer. Still, my friend, still a lot of my friends preach it even today. And I, but he was telling me, he said, you have taken one verse, one Old Testament verse of Scripture, and you built doctrine on it. Yeah. Do you have any other verses of Scripture to prove I rebuke the devourer? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you've built doctrine, and this is what he told me when he was rebuking me. He said, You've built doctrine on one verse of Scripture and testimony. Because, because every time I ever preached about Jesus rebuke or God rebuking the devourer, I always would use this verse and then I would give testimonies to try and substantiate this verse. You cannot build doctrine on testimonies. Because your experience and my experience doesn't substantiate the word. It, it doesn't make doctrine. Listen, People's experience, whether it's good or bad, doesn't establish truth. Right. Truth is established because God said it. Right. Thy, remember Jesus said, John 17, 17, thy word is truth. So if God said it, it's truth. Right? So then I asked, I said, okay, Lord. I said, you know, my head's spinning because I'm thinking now, you know, I've been telling people God rebukes the devourer. Now I'm up to tell them I'm wrong. <laughs> but I didn't. I did learn to be humble years ago, hanging around Brother Hagin. He said, you know, all of us have missed it. Just be willing to admit you missed it. So I missed it. But then I'm so glad I got this right because then I started seeing, and you're going to see this, this has been a plan of the devil for forever to convince believers that God rebukes the devourer. Because if we believe God rebukes the devourer, then we don't do what we're supposed to do in the new covenant. And that's why a lot of believers tried tithing and it didn't work. Or they've been tithing forever and they're still not operating in the windows of heaven blessings. In other words, financial freedom is because the devourer is having a heyday with their finances. And they're sitting there. I don't know if you've had this happen, but I've had people come up to me over and over and over. And pretty much ask this sometimes in a roundabout way and sometimes directly. You know, if God's rebuking the devourer, I've been tithing for a long time. What's up? Yeah. What's up, man? <laughs> Other people say, you know... I don't understand. It's, the Bible said God rebukes the devourer. Well, why are my finances always getting devoured? Is the devil hard of hearing? Is God not speaking loud enough? Has God gone to sleep and forgotten to rebuke? You know, all these different things people are asking. And really, you know, they're trying to figure out why is my finances being devoured? Why are so many Christians always having financial problems? Because there is a thief that steals kills and destroys and God under the new covenant no longer rebukes the devourer. So here's what the Lord said to me. He said, I no longer rebuke the devourer for my children under the new covenant. I've done better for you than that. I have 
defeated the devil. I've loosened you from his works. I've put him underneath your feet. I've given you the keys of the kingdom and dominion over him. Now you do something about him. And, of course, even with all that, I said, okay, okay, Lord, okay, but, 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 but take me in the New Testament. And so he took me through some scriptures. Let's look at some of them here t- tonight. Matthew chapter 16. Is this all right? Yes. I'm telling you, when you see this, you can see why the devil has wanted us, and we're, I'm talking us, the body of Christ, not just, not just certain denominations. No, word of faith, charismatic, full gospel. He's convinced all of us that God rebukes the devour. And you know what it does? It puts us in a position where we just sit back, we tithe, and, and, you know, try and release our faith. But then the devil comes along, and we don't resist him in this area. We resist him when it comes to our bodies, when sickness comes, because we know Jesus bore our sickness. Bless God, I'm not having that. We resist him when he attacks our marriage. We resist him in these other areas. We haven't realized how much the devil attacks finances. And so we haven't been aggressive with our faith to put him on the run. The Bible says a lot about it. Let's, let's look at some of it. Matthew 16, you know, this is when Jesus uh, and his disciples are talking, and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, some, of you say, some people say this. No, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter said, you're the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah. Christos is the, is the Greek word, and uh, the Son of the living God. And, of course, Jesus said, well, you're blessed, Simon Barjona, verse 17. And then verse 18, uh, you are Peter. The word is, is Petros, which is a piece of rock. So you're, you're just a piece of rock. But upon this rock, that's the word Petra, which in the Greek is a massive rock, which is talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he says, Peter, on that, that rock of revelation uh, about me, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of the church, the church. Verse 19, and I give to you, you, the church, the ones that have the revelation, you, Peter, but the church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But you tithers don't need to bind and loose because I'll rebuke him for you. That's not in there. Huh. Wasn't in there, was it? Does it sound like um, the church is the one that has the keys? Does it sound like the church is the one that has to do the binding and loosing? And notice it says nothing about tithers there, that they're exempt from that because God's going to rebuke them. Listen, if God rebuked the devourer, the devourer would have to listen. And if he couldn't devour... There wouldn't be nothing, nothing stolen. You'd be just swimming along in lots of financial blessings. Come on. Go, go two chapters over to Matthew 18. It, it says the same thing, but let's just look at Matthew 18, 18. <clears throat> Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Whatever you shall bind on earth, Shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, but you tithers don't need to bind or loose, I'll rebuke him for you. No, once again, here's another verse, doesn't say anything about because you're tithers, then you don't need to bind and loose. No, it says whatever you bind. Uh, Somebody asked me one time, I said, well, I said, let me explain this to you. I said, did you notice in Matthew 16, Jesus used the word keys so that we'd kind of get an image. He said, I give you keys. Now, what do keys do? Keys will either lock or, right, lock or unlock. And so somebody asked me, what does it mean to bind or to loose? I said, well, understand what keys do. I said, when you lock something out, you're binding, you're stopping them. When you unlock and allow something in, you're allowing or you're loosing, see? So you're supposed to bind, lock the devil out. You're supposed to un bind or unloose the power, the, the anointing, the blessings. So whatever you bind, God said, will be bound in heaven, which simply means whatever you lock, heaven's going to back you up. Amen. Whatever you unlock and allow, heaven's going to back you up. Does that make it easier to understand? Yes. So that's what he's talking about, bind and loosen, is just whatever you take authority over and you release out of your mouth, you're going to stop something or you're going to promote something to come into your life. God says, I'm going to back you up from heaven. 
whatever you say. Amen. Kind of sounds like life and death are in the power of the tongue. Hmm. All right. So, whatever you, oh, so go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. So, two verses so far seem to say that we have to do something even if we are tithers. Hmm. Matthew 16. Here's the passage, you know, we all know this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But I want to get down to the signs. Verse 17 says, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. So when we believe in his name, we have dominion over devils. Well, when the Lord brought me to this passage, he asked me a question. I'd never, I had never thought about it. Nobody ever taught me this. The Lord asked me, he said, um, what do you think that means, cast out devils? So I told him what I, exactly what I thought it meant. I, thought, I said, well, Lord, it means if somebody's possessed with demons or evil spirits, I can cast them out. He says, is that all? I said, what do you mean, is that all? I said, if somebody's full of the devil and full of devils or de demons or evil spirits, then I can cast them out. He says, that's not all that means. He said, I said, you could cast out devils. Are just devils just involved in possessing somebody or are they involved in other people, in areas of people's lives? Oh, I never thought about that. He said, do devils attack people's bodies, spirits of infirmities? So that's sickness. You can cast them out. Do devils attack people's minds with oppression, suicide, and all that stuff? He said, you can cast them out. Do devils attack people's marriages? He started naming all these things. He said, the devil attacks every area, and one big area is your finances, and you can cast them out. Amen. And nowhere in this passage does it say, but you tithers don't need to cast him out because I'll cast him out for you. I'll rebuke him. Uh-uh. Once again, it says the believer does the casting out. Amen. I mean, I've cast demons out of possessed people before. That was fun. I was out in Colorado one time and did that. I mean, this demon-possessed lady came to the service. I didn't even know she was coming. But, and afterwards, I talked to the ladies that brought her, and they had something happen that had never happened before. They didn't know she was possessed with demons. She, they just knew she'd been acting really weird. They were, she was a friend of theirs. And they thought, let's take her to Larry Hutton's service tonight because <laughs> demons are afraid of Larry Hutton. <laughs> they are. They're afraid of me because I'm... I know they're under my feet. They're defeated. Their head dog, their top dog is defeated, been whipped, stripped, and made a show of openly. So all of the cohorts underneath him are all whipped and stripped. So they're afraid of me because they know I know that. And so she, they brought her. And on the way in the minivan, there's three ladies plus the demon-possessed lady, but they didn't know she was demon-possessed. On the way to church, this demon-possessed lady starts talking in men's voices, men's plural, like three or four different men's voices started coming out of her. And here's what they said. This is just wild. The blood of Jesus is not good enough for me. The blood of Jesus is not good enough for me. I mean, they said the hair on their head and back of their head started standing up. <laughs> These three ladies said, oh, my God, we wanted to jump out of the van. <laughs> but it was really funny because they later told me when I was talking to the ladies, they said, we never said anything about the blood. We just said we're going to hear Larry Hutton. <laughs> See, the devils knew I knew something about what the blood did. So they're getting scared. They were trying to get those ladies not to take her, see. So they show up, make a long story short. While I'm preaching, she's looking at me like, at a, like, at a, like a wild cat stares at you, you know. But the funny thing is when I'd preach along, every time I'd look at her, even though she's looking at me like a wild cat, she'd look away as soon as I look at her. She wouldn't look me in the eyes. So I, I didn't catch it till about the third time. As soon as I looked at her and she'd look away, and, and I thought, that lady's possessed with devils. I'm going to have some fun with this. So I'd preach along, and I'd go like this. <laughs> and she'd go like this. And then I'd take my eyes off her. I'd preach a little bit, and I'd go like this, and she'd go. <laughs> so finally, I called. I, I, I said, bring that lady up here, and I laid hands on her. In fact, Pastor, this has never happened before in my ministry. It never happened since. It only happened one time. When I laid hands on her to pray for her, my hand became a huge magnet, and her head became a piece of steel. <laughs> I'm serious. When I laid hands on her, it was like, boom. I couldn't get my hand off. So now I'm attached to a demon-possessed lady. <laughs> 
And, and sh then she falls to the floor and starts slithering like a snake. And I can't get my hand off. <laughs> and she slithers all the way across. I'm just walking along. I actually was having fun, even though it was weird. But I, I knew, I knew this lady was getting freed because I knew the power was going into her. I couldn't get my hand off of her. She finally comes up against this wall. And when she hit the wall, then she just fell. And it was like she died. And all of a sudden, my hand was released. I didn't say a thing. Never said one word the whole time when I laid hands on her. Not one word. When she got up, she was saved, and she got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. Hallelujah. Gloriously saved. Delivered totally. So I have, I have actually ministered to people who are demon-possessed, but I, didn't, I thought that's all this verse meant. And when God said, no, you can cast out devils out of your finances. When he's attacking your finances, you need to take authority over him. All right, go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, another verse we all know. Notice we've gone to three passages so far, and none of them say that God rebukes the devourer for tithers, but it sounds like even tithers have to do something, yeah. right? All right, so Luke chapter 10, verse 19. <clears throat> and just in case, because I don't know, sometimes somebody hears you preach a message like this, I, I just want you to know I am not coming against anybody. All right, so maybe you have a favorite TV preacher and he preaching. Maybe he even said, Jesus appears to me and he tells me I rebuke the devourer. I'm not coming against him. I'm not coming against anybody. I'm just showing you what the Bible says. Then you make the decision what's truth, okay? But base it on the word, not what somebody says Jesus said or this. Base it on the word, the truth, right? So just so you know, I'm not coming against anybody because... If, if you hear your favorite preacher after you hear this message next week or something and he gets up and God rebukes a devourer, don't shut him off because maybe 99.9% .9 of everything else he says is right on. Just like Brother Hagin, have as much sense as an old cow, eat the hay and leave the sticks. <laughs> right? Because again, none of us know it all. So, all right, so Luke chapter 10, this is, you know, when this, this chapter is where uh, Jesus sent the 70 out. Remember, he sent the 12 out first. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils freely, you receive freely, give. And then he sends, in this chapter, he sends 70 out. Not apostles. 70 believers like you and me. He sends them out. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then they return, verse 17 says, they return and said, even the devils are subject to us through your name. And, and uh, then Jesus says, verse 19, I give to you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. How much of the power? So that would be all the financial power too, wouldn't it? Does all mean all or not? All the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But you tithers don't need to exercise that power because I will rebuke him for you. No, once again, tithers have to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy, including any power he tries to work on your finances. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. Ephesians chapter 6. You know, this is where we're told in verse 10 to be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. And then he starts talking about that, the, you know, Satan, he, he wants, to, wants to get at you. And there's principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of the world, and spiritual wickedness, high places. And, and then he starts talking about you're in my armor, right? That's right? And then in verse 16, he says this, above all, does that sound like it's pretty important? Right. Above all, take the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But you tithers won't need to use your shield. I'll rebuke him for you. <laughs> He's talking to the church at Ephesus. They're tithers. He's talking to New Testament Christians. They're tithers. And he's telling them, I'm giving you as armor a shield of faith that will stomp out or stop, which is what the word quench means in the Greek. To stomp out or stop every fiery dart that the devil shoots at you. Well, he's got physical fire, uh, fiery darts. He's got marital fiery darts. He's got mental, emotional fiery darts. He's got financial fiery darts. He's got a lot of different ones. But our faith can stop them all. Amen. But that means you have to use that shield. Because it didn't say, it didn't say, above all, take the shield of faith and you'll just automatically quench all the fiery dart. No, it said you'll be able. If you don't use it, it won't work. Hmm? You're able, but you've got to use your faith. 
You're enabled by the, by the grace and power of God. Amen. All right, so James chapter 4, here's another verse that we all know. James chapter 4, verse 7. Have we found any verse in the New Testament that said God's going to rebuke the devourer for New Testament tithers? Okay. James 4, 7. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But you tithers don't need to resist him because I'll rebuke him for you. Huh? Does it say that? Wow. Now, most Christians only know the second half of this verse. Oh, yeah, I've heard them shout it, scream it, resist that devil and he'll flee from you. And they resist and resist and resist until they get hoarse. And the devil didn't flee. He just threw some fleas on them. <laughs> so, so why does it not work for some? Because you can't do the second part of the verse without the first part. God says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. What does it mean to submit? It means you accept what God tells you to do in his word, and you do it whether you like it or not. Right. You submit. Okay, God, you said to tithe. Okay, I'll tithe. I submit to you tonight. If we're not tithing, we're not submitted to God. If we're not putting God first in our finances, we're not submitted to God. Then the second part of the verse is not going to work. You can resist and resist and resist, and he's not going to flee. He's going to laugh and eat your lunch and your snacks and your dinner and get up and eat your breakfast. <laughs> Come on. That's right. Why are so many Christians struggling financially because there's a devourer eating their lunch and they don't even know it? And they sit around and they tithe or they try tithing for a while. It doesn't work and they wonder why. And, well, I tried that tithing stuff. It didn't work for me. They didn't even realize that the thief is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Hmm. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Wow, time flies when you're having fun. I've already gone 50 minutes. Woo. Is anybody having fun beside me? The devil hates you that you came tonight. He did not want you hearing this. I'll bet you, I'll bet you, if I was a betting man, I'm not a betting man, but I'll bet you <laughs> that I could come to each one of you and I'll bet you there's a number of you that had things happen before you came tonight that gave you an opportunity not to come to church. I'll bet you some of you just had an opportunity and thoughts, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't go, maybe, well, this has come on, I don't know. I'll bet you some of you did because the devil doesn't want you hearing the truth. He's, he's been having fun stealing people's finances. He doesn't want you having the next 12 months be the best 12 months you've ever had of your life financially. When, when the nation economy gets worse and things happen in Wall Street and things happen in the world's economy and it looks like everything's going, and yet you have the best 12 months of your life. The devil doesn't want that. But God does. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, be sober and be vigilant. That means don't drink. All right, moving right along. <laughs> that one went over real big. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary who? The devil. So who is our enemy? This makes it about as plain as day, plain as you can get it, black and white. Come on. Who is our enemy? The devil, the, devil, the thief, the, the destroyer, the wicked one, the deceiver, the, the tempter, the liar. He goes by a lot of different names. But this calls him our adversary. And if you look up that word adversary in the Greek, it means arch enemy, Satan. So this is talking about the devil, Satan. It says, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, doesn't say he is. The word as is an indicator in the Greek language, which simply means he's acting like. Why is he having to act like a roaring lion? Because he's a pussycat with no teeth. <laughs> so all he can do is roar real loud. And he always roars lies. He roars untruths. He roars facts and realities that don't line up with truth so that you will believe what you see and what you feel and what you hear rather than what God says. So he always roars real loud, hoping that you'll believe what he's roaring and get afraid. Because, you know, that's the, first, that's the first reason a lion roars is if he can instill fear in his prey with that roar, first of all, it gives him a jump. He gets the speed up before all of a sudden that prey can take off and he can overcome his enemy. That's the first. He wants to put fear. Well, that's what the devil wants to do. That's his number one thing is to put fear in us. 
Fear is the opposite of faith. They can't dwell together. When fear comes in, faith leaves. When faith comes in, fear leaves. You, they can't dwell together. You understand that? Yes. So he wants us to be in fear. So it says, pay attention, be sober, pay attention, be vigilant. That means be on your guard because your adversary roars like a lion walking about seeking whom he may what? Devour. Devour. Yeah. Well, I thought God rebuked the devourer. Here we are in the New Testament. It says he's seeking, and it's talking to Christians, New Covenant Christians that are supposed to be putting God first in tithing. And he says to us, New Testament Christians, he says to the tithers, pay attention, be on your guard, because your adversary, the devil, is going to roar, and he's seeking to devour you. Now, I like that, because if he's seeking, that means he can't devour us unless we let him. Because it says he's seeking, right? Well, if he's seeking, that means when he comes to us and we submit to God and resist him, he has to what? Flee, which means then he goes to the next, he's still seeking. And every time he comes to a child of God that submits to the word and says, it is written, the devil has to flee. He can only devour the ones that allow him to devour. All right? So here it says, uh, he's seeking whom he may devour, verse 9, whom resist. Well, that's not talking about resisting ourselves. Can't be talking about resisting God. It must be talking about resisting the devil, right? Whom resist steadfast in the what? Faith. Hmm. Use faith to resist the devil. And it doesn't go on saying, knowing that you really don't have to because you're a tither and I'll rebuke him for you. <laughs> no. No, it tells New Testament tithers that we have to resist him and the word in the Greek, steadfast, is unmovable and unchangeable. That's what the word steadfast means. I'm not moving and I'm not changing. Which means the devil may attack me once, leave me for a season, but he's going to come back and attack me again. Because he's a persistent booger. So he's going to come back and he's going to attack me again. But it'll usually be in a different area. Maybe the first time he attacked me, jumped on my shoulder, whispered in my ear... I'll tell you what, your wife, sure, that, the way she talked to you, that, you know, you deserve better than that. What's he doing? He's roaring. What do I do? I stand up and say, he that finds a wife finds a good thing, lives a good thing, and I'm thankful for my wife. She's an heir together of the grace of life, and I thank you, Lord God. I honor her. I promote her in every way. I'm so blessed with my wife. And the devil said, this didn't work. And he flees. But he's going to come back and try another area. You get out of bed one morning and the devil jumps on your shoulder and said, this is going to be a terrible day. Don't you just feel terrible? And you get out of bed and said, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Lord. A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 might, but it's not going to come nigh me. No evil shall befall me today. No plague come nigh my dwelling today. Oh, the greater one lives in me and greater is he that's in me than he. And what's the devil do? Then this didn't work. Oh, he flees. So he comes back in another area. You're driving along and, and all of a sudden your car breaks down. And the devil jumps on your shoulder and says, oh no, you don't have the money to pay for car fixing right now. You're, you're, you don't have any extra money. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What's he trying to do? He's roaring real loud. He's trying to get you in fear. He's trying to get you to say out of your mouth, oh my God, I don't have the money to fix my car. How could this happen? That's exactly what the devil wants you to say. Rather than saying, glory to God, God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. Thank you, Lord, I have more than enough money to pay for my car. And not only that, I'm going to find somebody in my church and pay for theirs too. Hallelujah. The devil's head spinning. He's going, I tried to get him in fear and he didn't listen, so he has to flee. Are you all out there? Yes. That's how the devil works. So we have to resist him steadfast in the faith. And if you're not full of the word, you're not going to resist him steadfast in the faith. You've got to be unmovable. Every time he comes, you don't move. I don't care if he's attacking a different area this time. You don't move. He attacks your body. All of a sudden, you feel a lump or you feel a pain. Nope, you don't move. A few months ago, I, had, I was walking along, and all of a sudden, pain hit this knee. Pain. And all of a sudden, I, I mean, I could not bend it without pain. I, I had to fight that for several weeks I had to quit doing my leg exercises in the gym for a few weeks because it was too painful. 
I couldn't jog on the treadmill anymore. I, but I was not going to back down. I was going to be unmovable. And unst- I'm, not, I'm not changing. I'm unchanging. I'm not moving. Jesus bore my sickness, so whatever this is attacking me can't stay because it's not mine. Matthew 8 says Jesus bore my sickness. So if he bore my sickness, this sickness is not mine. It's trespassing. Because Jesus bore mine, which gives me the right to resist this one. It's not mine. It's got to go. It can't stay. And a few weeks later, it's all back to normal. But I've had that happen numerous times. I've had my lower back disc blow out where they, they just say, oh, my God, you're, you're, you're history. You know, all no, 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 no. I don't care what, what may happen in the natural. I know truth that will change the natural. So you just have to stay on top of everything. If I feel a pain in my body, a lump, a growth, something, I immediately attack it. I don't wait. I don't get in fear about them because God told me a few years ago, he said, Larry, if you, if you will not allow fear in any area of your life, no curse can operate in any area of your life. I refuse. I will not worry about anything because worry is fear. I will not get stressed about things because stress is fear. Those are all children of fear. I just, I refuse to fear about anything. I will not because God, first of all, over a hundred times in the Bible, it says fear not. I mean, if God said it once, it should be enough. Do not fear. Okay. God's got my back. Amen. But if he tells you over a hundred times, do not fear. Fear not. Do not fear over and over and over. And when I studied all hundred of them, I went through all of them in in the old and new covenant study. Every time where it says don't fear, I found out it covered don't fear about your children. Don't fear about your body, your physical health. Don't fear about your finances. I mean, all the, it was on all different subjects, covered everything, all the different do not fear. So I will not. That means it, it's going to be faith, faith or fear, your choice. Let's do faith. A lot more fun and a lot more peaceful. Because, see, when you believe, you enter into rest. That's true sign of faith right there. Am I resting or am I fretting? Am I resting or am I anxious? Am I resting or am I uptight? Am I resting or am I angry and mad? Am I resting? If I'm resting, I'm in faith. If I'm not, I need to do a checkup. Holy Ghost checkup. Go start praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man. I am flowing with the Holy Ghost tonight. I know I've been taking side journeys doing it. That's because I've been seeing things in the spirit about different people. So I got to obey God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. This is, I'm just having a ball. I just love it because you guys are thirsting and hungering after righteousness. So God's filling you. Hallelujah. All right. So again, does this passage right here say anything about God resisting the, 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 uh, rebuking the devourer for us? We've looked at verse after verse after verse after verse. And I'll just challenge you. If you can show me a verse in the New Testament that God rebukes the devourer for tithers in the New Covenant, I'll change what I preach. All I can preach is what the Bible says. I cannot preach it anymore because, well, that's what everybody else does. I can't preach it now because, well, that's what I've always preached. (laughs) No, I was wrong. I'll be the first one to admit it. But I'm so thankful I learned this because th- this has been a major ploy of the enemy to keep us ignorant of this truth. Because, you know, you, you can just sit back and wonder, you know, man, I'm tithing. I don't understand why all hell's broken loose on my finances. I'm tithing. God rebukes the devourer. What's going on? And, and you're not active with your faith like you are in other areas. This is either the top one or the top two reasons why people tithe and don't don't operate in financial freedom. The two that I covered this morning and tonight are probably the top two reasons why people would tithe and not, not be financially blessed. So I'm sure glad you came to both services. Yes. Amen. 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 Because the devil doesn't want you knowing this truth. So now, what are you going to do from now on if the car breaks down? Are you going to say, well, we can't afford that? You have a rich daddy. Don't you be saying you can't afford it. In fact, that was taken out of my vocabulary years ago. God rebuked me when I said, well, I can't afford that. And he said, is that what my word says? Hmm. Your God shall supply all of your 
needs according to his riches and glory, except what you can't afford. Mm -hmm. All grace is going to abound to you so that you have all sufficient in all things, going to abound to every good, except when you can't afford it. <laughs> no. We have a very wealthy father, and we're heirs of our father, and we're joint heirs with Jesus. Everything the Father has belongs to us. We should be saying the same thing Jesus said. John 16, 15. All things that the Father has are mine. Don't you ever let it come out of your mouth. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have the money. Or I can't afford this. It may be a fact that you can't afford it, but don't you let those words come out of your mouth because you're going to bind yourself. And you're going to open up the door for the devil to devour. Let me close with this testimony. I've gone an hour. Let me close with this. I came home off the road. We had a man that worked for 10 years by the name of Steve Rankin, good friend of ours even today, but he hasn't been with us for several years. But um, he, I came off the road. I'd been on the road several weeks, and then when I was home a couple times prior, it was for like a day and a half, and sometimes when I'm just home for a day and a half, I'd go in my office in the house and get everything done and get repacked because I don't have time to go over to the office at the ministry other than to, just to go over and say hi to the employees and maybe give them paychecks or something like that. So I hadn't had any time in several months to actually talk with my office manager. He's my office manager. Talk on the phone all the time, but not, you know, about anything personal or anything like that. So I walk in the office this day, gotten home, and I'm going to be in town for a few days. So I have a staff meeting. I meet with my office manager. And he said, Brother Larry, can I share something with you? I said, sure. He said, um, several months ago, he said, um, uh, I started getting attacked in my finances. He said, first of all, one of our cars broke down. He said, we got it fixed, you know, and had to take money we weren't planning on using to, to pay for it out of the out of savings account. And, and he said, then just the next week, my wife's car broke down. And he said, this time it was even more expensive repair. And so we had to dig into our savings account and pay for that. And he said, then the next thing happened the next week, our dog had to go to the vet. He said, man, he said, it just, it was starting to snowball. And it just, it was like, what are we, we're running out of money here. We can't just, and then he said, then the lawnmower broke down. And then the dishwasher broke down. And this just kept happening week after week and just, just eating up their finances like crazy. And he said, he was sitting in the office one day. He's telling me this. He said, I was sitting in the office and he said, Brother Larry, you know that you have us play our scripture CDs in the office. I have them so that everybody that calls Larry Hutton Ministries, when, when you get put on hold, you have to listen to me quote the word. <laughs> <laughs> so our on hold music is one of my scripture CDs playing. And so he said, you know, we have those playing all the time. He said, well, this particular day you had the Heaven's Wealth Food CD, the one that a lot of you bought this morning. The Heaven's Wealth Food, which is a whole hour of me quoting wealth scriptures and prosperity and increase in financial freedom script, scriptures. He said, so I was sitting there listening to it all day long. He, he said, I was a little slow, but about that seventh hour or eighth hour of my job, he said, all of a sudden, all those scriptures just started bubbling up in me that I've been listening to all day long. And he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm letting the devil devour my finances. All these things happening. They're happening all the time. We're going broke. I can't let this happen. And he said, I stood up, Dr. And he said, I stood up right there in my office. And I said, devil, you take your hands off my money. My money's blessed to the Lord. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. He prospers everything I put my hand to. I got more than enough money. Now you shut up, devil. Take your hands off my finance. He just started quoting the word, quoting different scriptures and all. And he said, he said, just like that. He said, a couple months had gone by and now he's talking to me about it and he said not one thing's happened Hallelujah. now I understand that some things are going to happen things wear out things don't last forever but I'll tell you what for a child of God they ought to last a lot longer than they do for the world yeah, right. amen. Amen. amen a lot longer <laughs> so let's uh, let's cast out devils amen. out of your finances amen. When he attacks, when it doesn't look like you have enough, don't you ever say what he says. Because he wants you to say, what am I going to do? I can't afford this. We never have enough money. Everything, every time we get a little extra saved up, something happens. That's exactly what the devil wants you to say, so something will keep happening. Mm -mm. From now on, 
Those of you that got the Heaven's Well Food CD, start listening to it regular. Get, get yourself full of the Word so that when things happen, you don't have to try and grapple for Scripture. Let's see, what does the Word say? No, it just comes out of you. You just take the, the Word of God and say, bless God, I'm a giver, and I thank you. I've purposed in my heart to be a cheerful giver. That's one that gives in faith, and all grace is abounding in my life. I have all sufficiency in all things, and God is multiplying my seed sown, increasing the fruits of my righteousness, and he blesses my bread and water, takes sickness away from me, and I'm blessed coming in and going out. Everything I put my hand to prospers, and yes. just start saying what the Word says. And you watch what's going to happen next 15 months. Ten months, eight months. It's going to start happening right away because God's going to confirm his word with signs following. Amen. New opportunities. Don't be surprised if God tells you to do something you've never done before. I don't know if I shared with you last time when I was here, but did I share with you about that one painting God told us to buy? Okay, I'll close with this one then. Last time I was fixing to close, this time I'm closing. <laughs> Remember I told you this morning that God started doing miraculous things after 2007, 2008, the worst recession in decades that our country faced, and yet my, my wife and I had more money come in during the worst recession than ever? Well, one of the things that God led us to do, we were out at another state, and God spoke to Liz and to me, to me, first of all, and he showed me a painting that was for sale. Well, I know nothing about art. Nada. <laughs> Zilcho, zero. So I saw this painting and I saw the price tag. $25,000 for a piece of paint, for a painting. I've never paid $2,500 for a painting. So I saw the piece of art and the Lord said, buy that. My first response to the Lord, I said, Lord, it's ugly. <laughs> I said, if I were to, I said, if, big time to him. I said, if I were to buy something like that, nobody would see it. I would not hang it on my wall. The Lord said, buy that. Well, because of us being faithful through the years, tithing and giving, and then him showing us, we bought and sold homes and done the different things God's led us to do to increase financially. So because of that, I had the money, the 25000 but I, I was having like, my head was going on tilt, going, whoa, 25000 for a painting? That's crazy. But I knew it was the Lord. So my wife and I were in agreement. We, we bought it for 25000 and I hid it in a garage. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not going to let anybody see that. Forget that. I don't want people saying, you bought that for, t you dumbo. <laughs> I didn't want people. So hit it. Well, <clears throat> not long after that, God told us, he said, sell the painting. Okay. He brought a buyer. Okay. Paid 175000 Pretty good increase. <laughs> and I never even hung it on the wall. 